Hello my beautiful co-creators, Lilu here. I'm in California today with an amazing, amazing man. I'm very delighted to be with you, Dr. Grof. Hello. Hello. It's Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for having us in your own home. We're here in uh, in the Mill Mill Valley. Mill Valley, it's called. Yes. Off of the Golden Gate Bridge. It, it's amazing to be sharing this kind of information. You know, being right now in California and people watching all around the world. That always amazes me. It's a, it's amazing what this new technology can do. Yeah. You know, how many people you can reach. Yeah. And how, how, how much this is part also of consciousness and raising consciousness right now around the world. The internet is tremendously helping that. Are you amazed yes, by what's is. happening right now with all the years of research? I think you've researched for over 50 years. And well, now it's, you're it's seeing amazing something. to see how you know, gradually uh, these new ideas are accepted. Although they're so challenging for the old uh, thinking in the academic circles, for the old paradigm. Yeah. It's uh, these these kinds of uh, major revolutions take time, you know that the when uh, Copernicus came with the heliocentric system, it took about a hundred years, and the resistance was not just just church. A lot of it was from universities that uh, they just were not able to to uh, digest this new idea, and so I think it's relatively fast. Uh, this uh, consciousness revolution is uh, doing. I love that you use the word conscious uh, revolution of consciousness or consciousness revolution. Um, well, I actually co-wrote a book. It's a trialogue with Peter Russell and uh, Erwin Laszlo, which is called the Consciousness Revolution. Uh huh. And this is happening right now. I believe so. Yes. What are the signs of such a revolution? Well, actually, I think we are in a, in a very important crossroad where uh, there are like two major trends. One is where the um, Western civilization, industrial civilization is going, which is increasingly destructive and self-destructive. And then there is this major awakening happening where more and more people you know, are opening up to the spiritual dimension that was somehow suppressed and lost during the industrial and, and uh, scientific revolution 300 years ago. How did we lose it? Why? Well, I think that what happened is there were some major discoveries made at that time that were sort of turned into uh, technological innovations that started changing the world. And there was this enormous enthusiasm about uh, what the reason can do. Mm. And um, you probably know that for some time uh, Notre Dame in, in Paris was called the Temple of Reason, mm. not, uh, not you know Temple of Virgin Mary. <laughs> so uh, there was this uh, excitement, uh, almost like intoxication, was the power of reason, yeah. and so everything that was not rational was kind of uh, discarded, as kind of uh, like embarrassing uh, leftovers, you know, from the dark ages or from from the childhood of humanity. Now we were sort of civilized uh, people, you know, mm. uh, intellectual people, and so on. And I think what happened is that somehow the people who were uh, involved in this uh, didn't realize that um, not everything that's not rational is irrational. Uh, what the mystics uh, um, bring to the world is not irrational, it's transrational. You know, I've certainly met many mystics in my world and they're, you know, they're perfectly rational, mm -hmm. but at the same time they experience certain dimensions uh, of reality that are normally hidden, and they added it to their uh, worldview, or they had to find integration of the traditional worldview and this worldview that comes from uh, from these mystical experiences. So I think we are now gradually sort of uh, recovering the spirituality that we lost. Mm. You know, we have still religions. I mean, we have Christianity and Islam and so on. And, Judaism, but uh, the organized religions really don't have much spirituality in them. And it you feels know. like we're all searching yeah. right now for this freedom also, like we're breaking free of something, aren't we, right now? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there is a major revolution that has been happening since the 60s, I think, in many, many different areas. Mm -hmm. You know, if you take uh, certainly civil liberties, uh, enormous development in the United States from what was happening in the 60s and now having a you know, black president and, and a, another major contender for presidency, a, a woman, mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton. 
and then you have major, certainly sexual revolution that's happening in, in very positive and not so positive ways. And if you compare the, the movies from the 50s uh, with the movies uh, from the 90s, you know, there's really nothing that we haven't seen <laughs> in the movies, whereas in the, the 50s, like, you know, Open Mouth Kiss was a, was a shocking for people. <laughs> Um, That's why you became so, the French kiss. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it's it's in many many different uh, different areas. You yeah. know, certainly uh, the freedom of information. That's amazing. It's, it's very difficult now for the totalitarian totalitarian regimes to control yeah. the information. They can still do it to a certain extent, but but what you see, for example, you know, the, how powerful now the new media is in. Uh, these revolutions happening in in uh, the Middle East and so on. Yeah, do you, do you think I mean social media and the 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 people are going to become the the leaders and take over governments and uh, and other structures that have been well, there for think, a long time? Well, I think I think they're ve they're very powerful tools, you know. But uh, again, tools can be used <laughs> in different ways. So yeah, I'm yeah. very curious what the outcome of those revolutions will be. I mean, the revolutions themselves seem to be very effective mm -hmm. and using the media. Certainly Obama's uh, um, election, you know, was, was successful because of the involvement of, uh, of the social media. There's no, que no question about that. And how important and, uh, is this revolution right now for th on a universal scale? Well, what is happening, you are asking about what kind of revolution it is. I think yeah. um, I am primarily interested in the part of revolution that involves inner powerful inner transformation mm -hmm. uh, that involves also uh, what I call holotropic states of consciousness. I use that term for a certain uh, important subgroup of non-ordinary states. It's like the states that the shamans experience as part of their initiatory journey or the kind of states that they induced in their clients when they work with them. Mm -hmm. The states that uh, the native cultures used in um, the rites of passage or some powerful healing ceremonies, the experiences of the initiates in the mysteries of death and rebirth, the experiences of the Buddhists, of the of the yogis, of the Taoists, of the Kabbalists, of Christian mystics, and so on. So I think uh, this is the, probably the most powerful tool in this in this revolution that. Uh, Many people are involved in spiritual practice. You know, there's uh, quite uh, quite a number of people involved also in uh, psychedelic uh, experimentation. Uh, there are many people undergoing what Christina and I call spiritual emergency. It's a spontaneous uh, mm. spiritual opening. Uh, there's tremendous interest in Eastern in Eastern philosophies and so on. So I believe that this can lead to uh, an inner transformation that would make a big difference in uh, the future of humanity. That we are now on a very dangerous uh, course, you know, that we are destroying somehow uh, what is the basis of our life as biological creatures, you know. What we need is uh, clean air, we need uh, clean water, we need clean soil. This, this should be sort of primary um, uh, imperatives yeah. for, uh, for the, the species and what we see is that you know economic profit and political concerns and military concerns really uh, are more important in, in today's world and we are really destroying the the base on which we so so critically depend so what I have seen in people who have done this uh, this work with holotropic states in a responsible way I'm not talking about right. this you know, um, parties in Berkeley yeah. where somebody throws in some yeah, some yeah. sugar cubes uh, laced with LSD into punch, and but I'm talking about about you know responsible spiritual quest, mm -hmm. whether with it's whether it and uses, on a scientific yeah level. whether it uses various non-drug means the what I call the technologies of the sacred, or whether it's responsible use of psychedelics, um, it can really lead to a very predictable transformation of people. For example. Uh, in the breathwork that we're doing, mm -hmm. holotropic breathwork, you don't have to teach people ecology when they have what we call transpersonal experiences. They experience oneness with nature, oneness with other species. Uh, you know, 
they experience their em fundamental em embeddedness in nature. You don't have to teach them ecology. I mean, they learn it on a cellular level from their experiences. Also, you can see the boundaries melting, whether it's racial or gender or, you know, political or, or cultural. And people uh, develop a sense of tolerance and compassion where they see differences as being exciting and interesting rather than something, you know, that uh, is a motive for, for fighting the groups mm. that are different from, uh, from yours. Uh, and also what you see uh, is opening uh, of spirituality, which is non-denominational. In other words, if, if we do the holotropic breathwork, um, we create a context for people to have non-ordinary experiences and uh, you know, provide support for that. But we have no investment whether these experiences will be Christians or mm -hmm. Christian or Sufi or, uh, or Buddhist or, or Hindu. So the experiences that people have are like the experiences of the mystics. They're kind of all-encompassing, all-inclusive. Yeah. It's very different from what you see in organized religions that originally started from transpersonal experiences, from spiritual experiences, mystical experiences. We wouldn't have these religions without the founders or the, um, the, the early disciples and so on, or the prophets having direct spiritual experiences. But when these... Uh, religions became organized, then in most instances they lose the connection with the spiritual source. And uh, what you see with organized religions is that they unite a certain circle of people mm -hmm. who somehow relate to the same kind of images, archetypal images, um, but they uh, automatically set that group against another group that have chosen another approach. You see, and then you have the situation, uh, you know, we are Christians and, uh, you know, you are pagans and we have to convert you or we are eliminate you. There is, everybody Which should be Christian. Separation. Or we are, we are Muslims and, uh, yeah. you know, you are, you are uh, infidels or we are Jews and you are Goyim and so on. We are uh, Muslims, you are Hindus. And then that's enough to, to kill each other. And uh, even the differences within a certain uh, creed are enough to kill. Yeah. Like there are centuries of fights between Catholics and Protestants, and between Shiites and the Sunnis. So that's not very helpful religion. You know, religion, by definition, should bind together. Religio means to bind, bind together what was fragmented. And uh, today, the religions they are dividing the world. And, that's a you know, significant uh, reason for people to kill each other now. Uh, it's not, it's the, not the whole God. story, but it certainly hmm. is a significant contribution. Yeah. So, so how do we get to those state uh, of consciousness, those, those non-ordinary state of consciousness, though, with, without uh, taking those psychedelics? You're saying we can do that through breath work as well? And to get to well, this place can, of unity you know, first of all, First of all, there are already powerful uh, spiritual technologies. You know, the, the Christians had the, you know, powerful exercises, the uh, Jesus prayer, for example, the hesychasm, or the, the exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, their powerful Kabbalistic experiences, there's certainly, you know, yogic, various forms of yogic method, uh, methods, uh, Buddhist methods, Taoist, uh, so the, shamanic people can participate in yeah. shamanic rituals. So there are all these technologies uh, uh, that are already available and you know psychedelics are just the most powerful and, uh, uh, tool that we have to be most careful about, about yeah. using because the more powerful the tool, uh, the more is the positive potential but also the greater is the, is the potential. Yeah, I, I just so want to make it clear here because so there's teenagers, there's uh, people from you know all different kind of different places in their life. We're not, you're not saying right now to take LSD to, to get to a place of unity and consciousness. There's well, other ways. Well, you see, I have I have tremendous all. I I have worked for many many years with uh, psychedelics and other methods, you know, changing uh, consciousness. I have tremendous all what these tools can do on both sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, psychedelics can be extremely healing and transforming if they are properly used. They can also be extremely destructive. I've yeah. seen people who, after really, you know, very, very uh, unskillful use of psychedelics, end up in a psychiatric hospital for 
for years or decades. So, so psychedelics are a tool, and tool, uh, the results uh, depend on how you use that tool. So we mm -hmm. talk about set and setting. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I certainly would not recommend doing raves where you <laughs> end up somewhere in an open space and uh, you know that you're doing something illegal and there's possibility of police coming and, and there's nobody who has any kind of a, uh, you know, sense of reality in there. Everybody's taking something. They yeah. don't know what they are taking. That's very, very dangerous. But at the same time, you know, psychedelics um, have been used for centuries by various cultures in the form of psychedelic plants, mm -hmm. for example, in Central America, South America, you know, North America as well, the peyote, the peyote uh, rituals and so on. And they have been used, you know, at the time when it was legal, they were used very effectively by psychiatrists, by psychologists. So they're powerful tool, potentially very useful, but uh, uh, the way they they're used by the young generation is just yeah. not only wasting uh, something that would be potentially useful, but doing something that's very very risky, very dangerous. Yeah, yeah. But you're saying that we can reach these uh, states of consciousness in another way too than taking those by through the breath yeah. work, for example. Or I mean, how can we as individual or people listening to this can start feeling the unity, can open to unity consciousness? Well, you know, can, how there is this possible? People having very powerful experiences with some of the traditional spiritual techniques. If you go okay. to a, a Zen Buddhist Sashin or you know, you go to uh, some kind of a um, um, uh, Sufi, uh, you know, Sufi uh, Zikr. Uh, um, those are those are very powerful techniques. Uh, practicing yoga, practicing you know different different forms of uh, of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, we have also powerful uh, methods that were developed as part of the uh, part of first humanistic psychology and then transpersonal psychology. And certainly the breath work that we developed, or reversing, or some other forms of mm -hmm. of uh, work with breath, they they have the potential to, to open these areas. Yeah. But I think what we need, uh, first of all, is to the recognition that these experiences are useful. Mm -hmm. You see, what happened is that current psychiatry pathologizes these states, so we don't have a category in psychiatry that would be mystical experience, spiritual experience. So when people have these experiences, and many people have them spontaneously, they don't have to do anything for yeah. it, they don't ask for it, they might even be fighting it, and they happen anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but when that happens, uh, the current psychiatry doesn't discriminate. You know, this is psychotic experience, this is a mystical experience. We have met, met many people who had experiences that would be perfectly normal, very valuable in some other cultural context and in, in uh, uh, the Western civilization people get diagnosed they are put on tranquilizers and, and uh, they get a diagnosis that actually is a diagnosis for life you know even if people have one episode like that and they don't have any other for the rest of their lives they would be called a psychotic syndrome mission mm -hmm. so just the just the potential of having that kind of experience is considered pathological and uh, from our perspective, this is an absolutely normal potential that we all have to experience transpersonal experiences. And I believe that the need to have transpersonal experience is the most powerful driving force in the human psyche. More powerful than sex, which, you know, as, as Freud saw it. Uh -huh. And if, if, that, if that need is not fulfilled, then it leads to various forms of, of pathology. So by, by ha not having those experiences right now in our society, that's how we're, we came to this place, really, where we're at well, right we have now. Lost, I think we have lost really meaningful, yeah. experiential spirituality in this culture. Yeah. We have religion, but that has the problems that I, that yeah. I described. You know, religions are not very, and by and large, not very helpful in the situation, the and crisis. science either. In the crisis that we're in. Science either. Western science needs a whole paradigm shift. Huh? We, we need, you know, very, very uh, radical changes of our worldviews. Yeah. 
which has already happened. Uh, but it's, it's very interesting that uh, it involves more physicists than psychologists and psychiatrists. When I first published some of the observations, you know, from first psychedelic research and then from the, from the breathwork, the people who were uh, most receptive uh, were not psychologists and psychiatrists, were modern physicists. Huh. And um, for me, it was extremely important to meet Fritz of Capra because I was, I was part of a small group that was working on these foundations of uh, transpersonal psychology with Abraham Maslow and Tony Sutic and uh, Sonia Margulies and Jim Fadim and Miles Vick and so on. And uh, we felt that this psychology made a lot of sense, you see. It didn't make the schizophrenics out of every shaman or founder of religion. It was very culturally sensitive. It didn't pathologize ritual and spiritual practice the way current psychiatry does. So we were very satisfied. With, we thought it made sense. The transpersonal psychology also incorporated all these observations from uh, consciousness research, you know, mm. from psychedelic uh, uh, therapy, from uh, mystical experiences, and so on. But we had no idea how that uh, how that new psychology could be connected to what we knew as science. There was such a deep gap. Mm -hmm. Uh, and even if it, if the psychology made sense in and of itself, it was very vulnerable to be called uh, unscientific, irrational, because it was challenging some of the most fundamental uh, metaphysical assumptions of, uh, of Western science. And for me, it was extremely important to meet Fritz of Capra, just uh, after he published uh, the Tao of Physics. We had a party, uh, Francis Vaughan had a party here in Tiburon, and uh, Fritz of Capra came and uh, was meeting people from the transpersonal circles. And uh, I just finished reading, had finished reading uh, the Tao of Physics, and I knew that was the way. You know, what Fritz was showing is that um, um, the medicine, biology, psychiatry, psychology, the way we know them, are actually based on 17th century thinking, what he called the Cartesian Newtonian. Mm -hmm. paradigm. And what happened uh, since the turn of the 19th and 20th century, after the discovery of radioactivity and x-rays and so on, was a major, major revolution, particularly in the first three decades of uh, 20th century, when uh, the, the whole Cartesian-Newtonian uh, framework collapsed and uh, physicists themselves moved to this uh, extremely revolutionary realms, you know, quantum relativistic physics. Uh, um, now what happened is that the other disciplines that models themselves after physics in the 17th century did not really follow. They're still stuck in the 17th century. And so uh, as a result of it now, the, the modern physicists who have this sort of quantum relativistic thinking, they're very open to what transpersonal psychology is, is mm. bringing. Yeah. So the, the new gap is not between, you know, uh, science and, uh, and spirituality, but, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the gap is between uh, the, uh, the old thinking, the old worldview and the, and the new worldview. And the old worldview uh, seems incompatible with transpersonal psychology, whereas everything that comes from the new paradigm is always welcome. You know, it's always sort of challenging somehow the the old uh, uh, thinking in in different scientific disciplines, but it's always embraced by the transpersonal circles as a kind of a new piece into the mosaic of the of the new worldview, within which uh, transpersonal psychology and consciousness research would be just an integral part of this of this new worldview. So, so Taz, there's also one thing that I would like to hear from you is your relationship to time, because there's, as you said earlier, there's kind of some kind of emergency, you know, to for mm -hmm. those changes, those paradigm shifts to happen now. Um, how, uh, what is your relationship to time, or what do you, how do you see it, and how much time do we have, and how can we transform our relationship to time? Because it seems to be really important piece right now for people to. Yeah, hear. I, I wish I knew how much time we have. That's a, that's yeah. you know. 
that's the $64,000 question, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we are involved in a race, and many people see it that way, you know, particularly when they, when they really uh, have some deep insights in these, uh, in these non-ordinary states, that we are in a race where the question is, we continue doing what we have been doing, mm -hmm. we might not make it as a species, so we might take a few species uh, with us. Uh, and the alternative is if uh, somehow uh, this inner transformation would happen, we can move, you know, to uh, a level which is unprecedented, uh, a sort of new evolutionary level where problems that seem completely insoluble now mm -hmm. would be easily solved. I mean, if we had our heads and hearts in the right place, you know, we would not have to have hunger in the world. or. Uh, not have problems of pollution and so on. We can. We already know what the alternatives would be, but mm. but there are you know major forces which are which are standing in the way of the of the transformation. I hope that, for example, when 9/11 uh, happened, that the response would be like a Manhattan Project uh, for solar energy. Let's put all the best intellects and all the resources into development of clean energies and create energy independence that would solve the political problems, you know, so that we don't uh, really uh, depend critically on what's happening in the, in the Middle East. Yeah. The United States really has no business in the Middle East. It wouldn't be there except for the, for the oil. So if this country could be, could be independent, if, if we had independent sources of energy, it would solve both the ecological problems, but also the uh, the political problems, and uh, the response was very different. It was not let's go for solar energy, let's have a, mm -mm. you know, let's have uh, energy independence, uh, kind of an old-fashioned. So how how can we be then in life? How can we relate to time? How can we be ourselves in front of those catastrophic sometimes event or some of those things that bring up fear, deep fear in us, and then that makes us not do the right or take the right decisions? Well, I think um, you know what what happens that each of us is looking at the at the situation in the world and it seems overwhelming. Like you know, who am I to yeah. to change the situation? Now, if you start thinking in a different way, that you start from yourself, that everybody sort of uh, looks inside and experiences the inner inner transformation. In our experience, it becomes kind of contagious. It sort of uh, moves. You know, Rupert Sheldrake has the idea of the morphogenetic field. And so, uh, besides what's happening in the social media and so on, that people actually connect with each other, there could be also a lot of things happening in se separate places where individual people do inner work mm -hmm. and you transform or contribute to the transformation that way. Uh, now we don't have you know, really scientific proof of that, but there's a belief, for example, in India that it's possible for the yogis who, who live in the Himalayas in a cave and hardly ever come out, that they actually get into states of consciousness that can influence the, the world situation. Mm -hmm. There were experiments, scientific experiments here, with transcendental meditation. That mm -hmm. They were showing that you can influence the criminality in a city by group meditations and so on. Pretty so, mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we need a new we need a new paradigm. Yeah. And and it's not that we have to create uh, create it from scratch. I mean, it's o the elements are already here, mm -hmm. but there is just a major resistance from the traditional academic uh, circles that uh, they hear, you know, they hear about these uh, uh, experiences that we are talking about, they just don't believe that they exist or they think it's, uh, it's uh, uh, psychotic, it's, it's yeah. sort of pathological and not something that they have to pay attention to, you know. So it's a major, it's a major paradigm shift and it takes time. And I think the crucial element would be uh, the media. You know, once once this kind of a new information would be disseminated by the by the media, that would just tremendously accelerate this. But, yeah, uh, and by but us too. You know, through those videos, like what we're doing right now, and them being shared online, 
uh, one person shares it with another and then to another. It, it goes very, very fast. It's in our own hands as individuals too. That's part of this inner work, isn't it? Yeah, you know, but for, for this kind of transformation to happen, it's not enough to disseminate the information. It's really important, but ultimately people have to do the, the inner work. Yeah. People. So how do you define so inner work? So ultimately, it has to, to sure? has to somehow inspire people yeah. to to, to get to involved in some kind of activity yeah. that uh, that uh, leads to transformation. Because usually we uh, see look at the situation and we believe that there's nothing wrong with us. It's sort of all it's the there. all the other people. But if you if you do the inner work, you discover that we all carry the the shadow uh, that Jung was talking about. And uh, that, you know, in some maybe not very obvious and more subtle ways that we all contribute to, to what is happening. And uh, So what is happening right now is what's also happening in here? It's a, it's a mirror? What we have in well, our reality, what we live see, in our reality, what, what we're what seeing is, in the world? What I think what is happening is a, uh, is a projection of, yeah. this, of these areas that we, were not, we are not looking at. For example, when somebody would go through what we call the psycho-spiritual death rebirth experience, mm -hmm. which is a major, one of the major patterns of that transformation, uh, it seems to involve uh, looking at your own biological birth and, and dealing with the emotions and, and physical energies that are still stored in the unconscious psyche and are influencing how you feel about yourself, how you feel about the world, uh, what you think uh, should be your behavior and so on. And it, there's a distortion, there's a sort of a, a certain unhealthy element, you know, in, in our lives. In, in some people it's more significant than in others, depending how much of that material is in the psyche and how close it is to, uh, to consciousness. Um, but if we, if we do it, uh, if we do this inner, inner work, that psycho-spiritual process of death and rebirth has certain stages. Uh, I talk about it as basic perinatal matrices. And uh, that the first matrix would be related to the situation where we are still in the womb. Mm -hmm. The second matrix would be now when uh, the uterus closes and we are in this kind of a no exit uh, situation. And then the third matrix is the actual struggle come out. through the birth canal mm. to come out. And then the fourth matrix is coming out. Now, if you look at the at the third matrix, it has uh, sort of a certain um, experiential qualities. For example, there is a lot of aggressive imagery that that emerges, images of wars and fights and struggles and so on. There's a lot of uh, sexual images, so the kind of an you know, it's not Romeo and Juliet kind of. It's a, <laughs> it's a, you know very very. Uh, hard, problematic, strong. problematic sort of uh, mm. images that have to do with sexual violence, uh, sexual aberrations, with red light districts, and so on. Uh, situations where people uh, use the other partner, you know, for their own satisfaction without any kind of emotional connection, and so on. Uh, there is a, a situation where we encounter this uh, biological material. You kind know, of, I call it a scatological. Scatos means like dung or uh, excrement and so on. So there is that, that stage as we are coming out and we are sort of covered by, by all that stuff. Uh, now there are, certain, uh, there are certain elements in this that we see now actually enacted in the world. For example, you see a tremendous unleashing of, of aggression now. You know, the world is becoming more and more dangerous. The, the, the uh, terrorist uh, movement and so on. And uh, if you look at the American cities, they are sort of becoming increasingly less safe with all the drug traffic happening and so on. Now, in, if you do it internally, you would experience this sort of unleashing of these aggressive images, but would not be, you would not be hurting anybody. You would be just mm -hmm. processing it. You would be purging it out. You would be cleansing that. At the same time, you would, be, you would experience a lot of sexual imagery again. Uh, and again, this would be part of the purging. Now, we see it also happening in the world. I mentioned, you know, that if you compare the 50s and the 90s, and uh, uh, 
you know, the kinds of things happening in San Francisco in the underworld and so on. It's, it's quite, quite amazing. So there is this unleashing of this repressed uh, sexual impulse. Then we also see this, uh, this pollution, this, this sort of scatological element happening in the world. Mm -hmm. If you look at all the industrial dumps and so on and all the, the problems that we have in that. So, um, you see, the, the, the kind of elements that we would confront internally if we get involved in this inner transformation, we are actually projecting, we are sort of releasing all those energies in the, in the world. And, you know, the end, if you internalize, the end would be death, rebirth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you if you project it out, the the end product is destruction without the without the uh, you know spiritual opening. So um, this is how many people see it that we are sort of in this race. Or is it going to go right. one way when we are just going to really destroy our world because of all these uh, unresolved drives that we have, or are we going to be able to uh, look at them and to bring them into full consciousness and, and integrate them and are we going to... It's almost like turning into another species. Yeah. You know, people, people whom I have seen really successfully completing this kind of process, they seem to be like members of a different species. So it's like, like coming from Star Trek, you know, from mm -hmm. the, the, the um, value system of the Galactic uh, Federation there in, in Star Trek. Like, uh, you know, the, the, these people have this idea that um, they feel like they are planetary citizens before they are members of any particular uh, country, that we should have a global constitution where protection of life and environment is primary because we are biological creatures, where aggression is not an acceptable form of solving problems, you know. So people people develop these kinds of values, and if we had if we had species uh, composed of those kinds of individuals, we would have certainly a much better uh, much better chance uh, for survival. Mm. You know, one of the basic uh, things that people realize in this in this kind of work is that the uh, the planet is a closed system. So what we are doing is that turning. Uh, non-renewable resources, the fossil fuels, into pollution is a one-way street. Whereas the way nature was operating before, everything was being recycled. Everything that was created was also destroyed and became the building material mm -hmm. for something else. So people who have a decent insight into the, these cosmic cycles and so on, they would never get involved in, in activities which are which are the sort of linear, one-sided. You know, you're increasing the pollution uh, yeah. of air, of uh, um, you know all the industrial products. Uh, some time ago, I listened to a, an uh, interview of a woman who was an ecologist, and she mentioned it's just part of the things that they discovered in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, an island of floating plastic of the size of Texas. Really? So, you know, if we continue doing this kind of thing, uh, it yeah. will not take a very long time. You see in some of the cities, Mexico City, yeah. San Paolo, uh, Tokyo, to some extent in Los Angeles, you see what the world would look like if we continue doing what we, what we are doing. And, uh, and I think unless there is some kind of really change, deep change in people's consciousness and mm -hmm. change of their value system and priorities, you know, we don't have, we don't have much, much chance of making it. Do you, do you believe in lives outside uh, this planet, in extraterrestrial lives? Uh, I don't know. I had the experiences and many, many other people had the experiences, you know. Uh, um, in our training, the, the breathwork training for practitioners was, uh, was John Mack, who has done some significant work with the people who experienced the alien abduction, uh, abduction uh, experiences. Uh, and uh, it was on all the talk shows and wrote books about it, like abductions, and one was called the, the Passport to the Universe and so on. 
So it's a very real phenomenon. I mean, we can, you know, encounter uh, uh, these um, supposed visitors from, from other worlds. Or supporters? Now, Are these well, supporters? I, <laughs> yeah, well, what's uh, happening right now? I think that the most, most likely explanation for that is that it's... Uh, those are manifestations from the collective unconscious. It, uh, Carl Gustav Jung wrote a book about it and the, and the UFOs. And this was his his perspective. You know, the many many of them have sort of um, certain characteristics of the kind of figures that you find in the in the mythologies of different cultures and so on. Uh, so part of it could be seen as just a mythology for our for our time, but the experiences are very. Very real. Very real, and they have what Jung called psychoid quality, because sometimes, uh, first of all, it can involve more than one person. There's a consensual mm -hmm. validation that they they all agree that they have experienced or or seen something, and the other thing is that it's frequently connected with events in the physical world. There was a situation where there was a, a Japanese 747 flow, uh, uh, flying over Alaska. And they all saw the, saw the passengers, saw a spaceship, and the crew, trained crew, saw a spaceship following the, them. And uh, the radar on the ground registered two objects. Mm -hmm. And then it was a sensational uh, uh, situation, you know, headlines. Uh, and uh, when the uh, radar operator saw it, he sort of, uh, you know, um, denounce it. He says, well, he already checked the record and on careful um, um, scrutiny, mm -hmm. that second point was just an artifact, only that one, only that one thing was here. But what's this interesting synchronicity between the, what they saw, what they all saw on that plane and what mm -hmm. was appearing on the radar. Or sometimes people see, uh, you know, this flying saucer landing and they go there in the morning and there is a burned circle there. So, so there are these kinds of strange synchronicities. Uh, for me, the most uh, moving uh, evidence was uh, John Mack traveled to Africa when there was a report about a school of African children, a teacher and a class, mm -hmm. saw uh, flying saucer. He, he interviewed them uh, quite independently and made a video about it. And, they were certainly not children who were influenced, you know, by our own uh, uh, news here, media, and so on. And, and it was so it seemed so honest and so real what they were talking about. Yeah. So, so, it's a, it's so we uh, may not be the most intelligent thing in this entire universe. <laughs> well, I don't, you know, I I don't know what it is. I just know it's a it's cannot be dismissed as uh, some yeah. kind of misinterpretation of some meteorological phenomena or that these people hallucinate, they're crazy. I it's mean, time to bring it up. It's too, it's too simple. It's a, it's a phenomenon for which we don't have any kind of explanation. And uh, John Meg, who actually he is dead, he was hit by a uh, drunk truck driver in London when he was crossing the street. Mm. But he started, as a result of it, he started something called PEER, which was an um, organization studying uh, anomalous phenomena, you know, phenomena that current science has no explanation for. And this, this phenomenon certainly would, would belong there. So, you know, it's, it's very baffling for us. I'm, I'm you know, great uh, aficionado of these um, books of modern physics, and uh, Michio Kaku is a very, very interesting uh, writer. And he writes about hyperspace and uh, the possibility of uh, visitations uh, mm -hmm. you know, from other planets or, or traveling to other other planets and so on. And it's a very, you know, it's very very fascinating uh, material. But uh, if they were coming, if they were real visitors, they would have to have technology that we hardly can imagine, or maybe we have some some intimation of what would have to happen. You know. The distances are such that they would have to like enter into hyperspace and re-enter, or you know, reaching uh, velocity exceeding speed of light. Or, uh, but that must so intrigued you as a scientist to. Well, I know it's experientially it's real. 
you know yeah. I mean many people had in the breath work had the experiences in psychedelic sessions I have had yeah I, I wrote a book called when the impossible happens oh which, yes yes yeah, yeah which where all the stories are stories of uh, mm -hmm. you know describing events that should not be possible if uh, the monistic materialistic science uh, were right in terms of describing uh, the world, and I describe some of my own uh, experiences of the of the extraterrestrial intelligence. And so you know where it's coming from. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a very real phenomenon. Yeah, and we're, I love I love what you say. And this is really I know we spend a great amount of time with you here, and it's such a delight you know to to share all this information right now with everybody and I just love it's it's so great to hear to hear all this and we need to hear all this right now and we are evolving as a new species where ourselves you know our DNA is transforming our our capacities are increasing our telepathy is increasing and it seems like the internet too is a big part of that in helping us to communicate in new ways and new things are possible everything is is, is possible these days isn't it and very fast mm -hmm. the impossible is possible yeah, it's it's, a, it's amazing. I mean, the, these new technologies started approaching uh, or, or mimicking uh, psychic phenomena. You know, now you can sort of see what's happening anywhere in the world. You know, mm -hmm. when you have a satellite, and we, when we were in Big Sur, we had uh, we couldn't get a signal there, the regular signal. So we had the satellite dish, and so besides the ordinary channels, we also get the feeding channels where these different stations have people in different parts of the world and when things are happening they are sort of filming it and they sending it to their stations so you can see in real time what was happening in you know in India or Pakistan or hmm. in the Middle East and so on or you have cell phone you can communicate uh, you know before the, the idea of what the psychics can do psychics can sort of connect with somebody the other part of the world you know or you can see you can see now in your iPhone, you can see any part of the world. You just, you just, you know, ask for what you want to see, and it comes, and then you can, you can sort of amplify it to mm -hmm. the point. I mean, we can, you can, you can find our house, for example. You know, and you can, you can see uh, in that way any any place on, on the planet. Before there were some, you know, some uh, reports about. Uh, remote viewing, some of the experiences that were done at Stanford Institute where there were, you know, people like Ingo Swan who were able to sort of tune into it psychically and, and then describe a, a place somewhere on the surface of the of the planet. Now anybody can do it, you know, with this... Uh, yeah, and soon we might not even uh, need these anymore. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> Maybe it's preparing us, for, that's what you're saying, right? That maybe it's preparing us for another way of communicating without those devices and without. Well, the, you know, there is a uh, there's certainly a, that trend because there are uh, situations like near certainly near death situations, certainly these uh, abduction experiences, but also people who have just psychedelic experiences. So the holotropic experiences, the uh, level of intuition increases, uh, the incidence of uh, ESP phenomena. So we, we certainly have that capacity, you know, and uh, we, we knew uh, Anne Armstrong, who was a phenomenal psychic, she used to come to our uh, months-long workshops at SLN, and she was actually teaching the groups how to cultivate their own uh, ESP, you know. The idea was that everybody has that capacity and it can be like anything else, it can be cultivated and uh, she believed that our culture actually kills it in mm -hmm. in children. That children come with that capacity, but because of our dis disbelief, you know, yeah. that it is possible, that we just sort of discourage children mm -hmm. from going in the direction. Uh, and if there were sort of more uh, openness and more encouragement and even award, you know, for in people who have now psychic phenomena, they uh, have a you know, better chance of getting a diagnosis than being uh, rewarded in any way or appreciated for that. I know there's your there's your little granddaughters here. Do you, are you are you surprised by 
their capacity, their their gifts, their them coming in the world, are they different? Are they are you moved by them, I guess, and beyond just well, the being part of your family, but really who they are as individuals. Uh, they, of this you know, planet. they are amazing. Uh, um, part I think part of it is the the type of birth that they had. You know, our our daughter Sarah and her uh, husband Forrest, they did a home birth. They just had a a, a little, uh, oh, yeah. you know, the, uh, hot tub with a. It's not hot. It's a warm tub. Yeah. You know, with a with a thermostat, and they did everything uh, at home. They had a midwife. The midwife didn't come until the contractions were like maybe four minutes from each other. They did it all uh, together. We were actually invited to this uh, last birth. We were Christ Christine and I were there, kind of wow. holding the space and. Uh, uh, so just just that this type of birth, you know, unhurried, uh, no no bright lights and so on, and you know, no machines a, beeping. Yeah, a lot of a loving loving environment that mm -hmm. certainly would make a big big difference. I believe that, uh, as as I mentioned, that the, the birth trauma plays really a major major yeah. uh, role in our unconscious, uh, you know, uh, in that part that Jung called shadow that. Uh, we carry a lot of difficult emotions and and undigested sort of physical energies, unreleased physical energies, and that uh, how we conduct birth is really makes tremendous difference in people's future future lives, and also the postnatal care, the you know certainly the nursing and all those things uh, make a, make a big difference. Uh, and they also come, you think, with higher vibration or just a, a more a bigger capacity to be telepathic or it seems like it's a new kind of children too being born beyond just the birthing way well it's also you know i believe that the that uh, for the indication that we have from uh, people reliving the prenatal state and so on that in the prenatal state there is connection to the whole uh, to cosmic consciousness to that larger matrix to to the transpersonal realm and if you have easier birth if it's handled better then part of you sort of remains connected there whereas if it's a if it's a very kind of a brutal traumatic experience it kind of you know, tends to cut you mm. igor charkovsky believed that by uh, making the birth easier that it provides like a channel for incarnation of some higher uh, beings you know mm -hmm. higher higher uh, consciousness but then he himself sort of went a little overboard, and uh, I think people like uh, Michel Audin, you know, uh, have uh, adapted this uh, this method and uh, doing it in a in a saner way than uh, than uh, Igor Charkovsky. Mm -hmm. One of the things Igor Charkovsky did, he bound the um, hands of the children behind their back and let them swim. They had to swim like oh. long distances and so on. And, uh, uh, so, so um, um, dunking them in, in uh, freezing water, he wanted to create a kind of a you know higher uh, species. Wow! Uh, but I think that element of un underwater birth is a very, very uh, interesting and very healthy kind of uh, phenomenon. So you're, are you at a place of uh, excitement right now for where, where are you at in your life or what's going on and what's happening and just in general? Well, I think it's an extremely interesting time to be, to be alive, you know, uh, and uh, you can see that uh, this period that we are experiencing now is very unique. I mean, you know, there were sort of uh, ideas about the end of the world, but it was never a real possibility it would have to be some really major um, you know either cosmic catastrophe or or some kind of a s supernatural intervention but now we are in a situation where we really can either have a completely different humanity and a completely different planet or we we might really destroy ourselves i mean it, you know there's some of the some of the major things which is like the the, the nuclear nuclear weapons and so on, but then you have the industrial pollution and all kinds of other things that are probably more subtle, the things that we put in, in our food and so on, how it's going to influence uh, 
you know, heredity, mm-hmm. um, you know, how it's going to influence uh, uh, incidence of, of some diseases. There's some studies showing that maybe uh, brain cancer might have something to do with the use of, uh, of uh, cell phones. You know that increases the, the the vibrations that we are that we are exposing ourselves to. That's going to be big scandals in the future, aren't they? Those those cell phones. It is well, huge. The, the information is not being shared again on that level. Well, this you know the idea is that we created this in just enormous uh, uh, amount of electromagnetic vibra- uh, vibrations of various kinds. All yeah. the all the powerful television stations, radio stations, and then, you know, all that's happening with the, with the cell phones and so on. You know, biology is not equipped for this, so we don't know what, what kind of impact this is going to have. Yeah. But this is all, everything happens and is perfectly timed and all is well mm-hmm. for us to birth something new right now in this new species, so I think I think if news. we Let's can... Let's stay on the positive note. Yeah, if we could, you know... <laughs> If we could go uh, through this powerful inner inner transformation, I think uh, you know many many of these problems would would seem to be easy. Mm-hmm. Whereas now it's like walking through molasses if you want to achieve some kind of a mm-hmm. some kind of an improvement. Uh, I would have a lot of hope for a pe- for humanity that would be uh, composed of the kind of people that I have seen. You know, really changing, changing internally, moving moving uh, to a very different way of being and developing a, a different kind of system of values and different, uh, different life strategy. Yeah. Who is a person that we all know in, uh, in like public domain that would incarnate those values right now, oh. that you admire and that you recognize and that you're like, you know, this is a great example? Well, you know, there's. Uh, I don't know uh, that it would be uh, somebody whom I have seen going through that process, but you know, certainly I admire very much uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I, I admire very much Václav Havel. You know, my, the ex-president of, of uh, Czechoslovakia, whom I had a chance to meet personally. So there are people, you know, people like that. You know, certainly. Uh, Mandela is a person in, in that category. So if we had statesmen, you know, uh, of, of that kind of quality, I think things could could happen. Mm-hmm. But I've seen what I'm talking about is ordinary people, people yeah. who've been in our training. And yeah. I've seen them, yeah. you know, uh, really changing dramatically their way of uh, of being and uh, looking at the world. And, and, uh, what an inspiring life you have! What a juicy life! This is what the Juicy Living Tour is about. The what? What is? This is what the Juicy Living Tour is all about. <laughs> you Ju- have a juicy life, seeing those transformations, juicy, yeah. well, and seeing uh, seeing people uh, rebirth. I, th- and I think we have had very. Amazing. I think we have had very interesting life. I, you know, yeah. Both Christina and myself, not always easy, but uh, but certainly very, very fulfilling easy. in the heart. Yeah. I, I think I would not trade it easily. <laughs> thank you again. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you for this uh, moment. It's been uh, very, very great. Thank you. Okay. Actually, all my beautiful co-creators. This was an awesome interview with uh, Dr. Grove. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to see more interviews, you can go on juicylivingtour.com. Bye-bye.